Hello and welcome to our webinar. Um, if you're joining us today, our, our topic is, uh, if you care, leave it there, helping baby wild birds. Um, Dr. Heather Barron will be on with us in a second. Uh, gonna give some people a little bit of time to log in and join us. Um, so, I thought we could do a little bit of cute baby bird, baby wild bird photos, um, just for fun. I find these guys adorable, hopefully, uh, Evil too. Okay. Let me share right here. Okay. So these are just some really cute wild birds um, pictures, uh, baby birds I found online. Um, look at that guy. It's very uh, kind of dinosaur looking, but I think he's adorable. Um, if you notice, well, I noticed that uh, don't wild birds have the, the bright orange in the mouth so the parents can find the, the find where to deliver the food really easily? Oh, that bird definitely has that uh, very cute little guy. And then this one, he's like a little teardrop on the ground. Uh, look at those ginormous feet. Uh, just like puppies have big feet, I guess baby birds have big feet as well. And okay, they say the connection between a, um, birds and dinosaurs. This guy kind of reminds me of a dinosaur. And this last photo, oh, not the last photo, oh, second last photo, uh, look at the cute little guy there. I think those are like cobwebs on the, the little nest there, which is fascinating to me. Um, kind of hidden there. I think you'd walk right by that little guy if, uh, if you're walking in the wild there. And then this one, okay, this is the test if you are a true bird person. Because some bird people, some non-bird people don't find these kind of, <laughs> the naked chick very, very cute looking. But um, bird people tend to find these guys adorable when they don't have a single feather on them. I am one of them. So there you go. There's some, uh, some baby chicks because that, of course, is our topic today. And... With that, I would like to dive in here. So hopefully we have all of our people joining us. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to the vet students from the University of Illinois and Ross University, as well as our international viewers. We've got viewers from Canada, Africa, the UK. Uh, very excited to have you with us today. And I'm also extremely excited to introduce our special guest, um, Dr. Heather Barron. And she is, um, she is the director of the Clinic for Rehabilitation of Wildlife on Sanibel Island, Florida, and also a board, a board certified um, in medicine, and she is the past president of the Association of Avian Veterinarians. So Dr. Barron, big welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And I am very excited to learn about what to do if I find a baby bird in the wild and, um, and baby uh, birds and wildlife in general. Uh, if you don't mind, take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's saying that you have disabled me sharing my screen. So I think you just have to click over me and uh, enable me to share with you. Okay, here. Um, okay. let me hear. Hmm. Um, so usually if you hover your cursor over my name, mm -hmm. there should be like some little box, little tiny dots there. If you hover over that and click on it, it should tell you that you, I can share my screen. Like you should be able to enable me. Okay. Okay. Bear with this. Um, this is... Okay, let me see if that works. Yes, that's Yay. got it. Okay. You got Ooh. it. Good job. <laughs> that would be important to be able to share your screen today. So. <laughs> yeah. Glad that worked. 
Yeah, you guys don't have to look at my ugly mug. You just get to see my cool PowerPoint slides. So um, thank you so much. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us here today. I'm super excited to talk to you a little bit about um, if you care, why you should maybe leave a baby wild bird uh, there in the wild and really how we discern the difference. And if we have to take that baby in, um, what are our next steps? So uh, the okay. problem as I see it is that um, frequently uh, young birds are abducted by well-intentioned people who believe them to be orphaned but in fact it's just that they maybe really don't totally understand the natural biology of the species and it's interesting in my years in wildlife I've really seen kind of a a shift in how we handle this problem when we get this call in wildlife. So um, when I first came here to Crow about a decade ago, uh, if somebody called or brought in a baby wild animal, um, they just admitted that animal and, and then did the best they could to raise it. Um, but today we really try to educate uh, people who call in that say that they have found what they believe to be orphaned wildlife. Um, and, and because of that education, I've really seen a shift in our caseload. So it used to be about 80% of the, um, well, now it's a, up to almost 6,000 patients a year, but back then it was about 4,000. And um, it used to be about 80% of those were juvenile animals. Um, now with the If You Care, Leave It There uh, program that we've started here at Crow and simply by by educating the public in our area, we've actually gotten that caseload down to um, only about 34% of our caseload is juvenile animals. And, and that, again, is because generally um, when young animals were being brought in, they were mostly being abducted um, away from perfectly healthy, competent parents. So that's kind of the problem as I see it. So what do we do about that? Well, um, I think, uh, you know, if you are a person who is concerned about uh, birds and um, likes to see them out in the wild, or if you're a veterinarian or coming up to be a veterinarian for all you wonderful um, vet students out there, uh, there probably are some myths about um, wild birds and wild baby birds in the wild that we kind of need to dispel. And the first is um, that wild animals are really ever or abandon their young. That's incredibly rare. Um, maternal and paternal instinct kind of really overcomes all and um, most wild animals will do everything they can to stay with their babies. Uh, the second myth that we often need to dispel is that if a human touches that baby that the parents won't ever accept it back and and that generally is um, really not true. Again that that instinct to um, uh, parent those babies is a fairly strong instinct and um, even uh, you know parents will often um, defend their young vigorously uh, and um, so you don't have to worry about that. The next is that wild birds won't care for their young unless they're in the nest. That's not true either. Um, uh, baby birds, especially if they're fledging or down on the ground, that's a natural part of their development. And their parents, even if you can't see them, are right there watching those babies, feeding those babies, um, often, again, protecting those babies. Uh, so don't worry about those little guys. It's, it's really sort of a natural part of the development. Also, if the nest, quote unquote, fell out of the tree and there's really nothing left of the nest, um, there are lots of things that we can do to get those babies back where those parents can care for them again. And um, we'll talk in a minute about how to make faux nests for these guys. But um, if the nest fell down and you replace it in the tree, even if you can't get it up to where it fell from originally, or if maybe that tree fell down or was cut down, 
down. Um, you can put it in surrounding trees, surrounding bushes, and, and those parents will still hear their babies calling and come back to them the majority of the time. So even if you have to move that nest, um, that's, that's the other myth that we can dispel is um, that the parents won't be able to find it. Trust me, those babies are super loud. Those parents know exactly where those babies are. Um, another myth is that um, it's only the mother that uh, usually cares for these um, orphaned babies. And so people will say, well, you know, I saw the mother get killed by a cat or hit by a car or whatever. So, so now the babies must clearly be orphans and they must need to come in um, because uh, for many wild mammals, it's true that it's only the mother that caretakes. But for birds, um, generally both parents caretake. So even if something has happened to the mother, there's a very good possibility that um, the dad uh, can um, continue to sort of uh, do the job alone. And finally, something that I hear fairly often is that um, baby birds are safer if they're brought into captivity. So, you know, people say, well, you know, I saw snakes hunting those birds or whatever. So they, they need to come into the captive environment because I, I can do a better job raising them and they'll be safer that way. Um, and that really isn't true. Uh, humans definitely don't do a better job and, and we'll talk more about why in a minute. But also, uh, it is rarely the case that humans should interfere in nature. Even if you do see a snake um, eating those wild baby birds or whatever, remember snakes have to eat too. And um, again, it is actually illegal for you to interfere uh, in that situation. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, is it legal for you to interfere? Uh, there are a lot of different acts that actually protect our native and migratory birds. So MBTA, um, which just uh, celebrated its 100th anniversary here recently, the Endangered Species Act for many species of birds, a uh, beautiful picture of a little painted bunting here, uh, the Lacey Act, um, for eagles, the Eagle Protection Act of 1940. So there's a lot of different acts that protect those birds. And it is in fact illegal for you to go into the nest or interfere. And if you're not sure, it is always a good idea to reach out to your local wildlife um, rehabbers or to your state wildlife officials or even US wildlife officials um, if you have a question about whether or not it's appropriate appropriate for you to intervene. And some of those regulations that I'm just going to make a, a brief reference to include that Migraport Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918. And um, this particular portion comes from the Code of Federal Regulations or CFR 2111. And that says, no person shall take, possess, import, export, transport, sell, purchase, barter, or offer for sale, purchase, or barter any migratory bird or parts, nest, or eggs of that bird. So um, you may think that these eggs that you're seeing here are beautiful beautiful and that they would make a lovely decoration in your home if you just, you know, took them and blew them out. Maybe you think the um, eggs themselves are dead and that it would be okay for you to interfere and take the nest and take the eggs. But the truth is, if you're caught with those in your home, it doesn't matter if you thought that they were dead initially, you would um, still be uh, liable to prosecution. And um, this can actually come with very high fines and potentially even jail time. So, um, uh, you know, again, if you care, you should probably leave it there because if you don't, you could get into trouble. Now, of course, there are exceptions to every rule and one is the Good Samaritan rule. So um, if you find a baby bird that's injured and um, you're trying to get it to a veterinarian or a wildlife rehabilitator, you're actually legally 
legally allowed to have that wild bird in your possession up to 24 hours until you can get it to someone who can actually provide care for it, but you should not have it for over 24 hours. So um, I think it's important, uh, particularly if you're a vet or a vet student um, or somebody who uh, is in an area where you see a lot of wildlife, um, that in addition to those Federal Endangered Species Act, most states actually do have local legislation that's going to protect almost all animals. Of course, there are some exceptions to this and some of the more exotic species that are not native to the U.S., for example, English sparrows or starlings or um, rock doves, also known as the common pigeon, uh, also domestic animals that have become wild, so uh, things like these um, adorable little pigs here, uh, feral cats, those are not protected um, by most state or federal legislation. Now, still, if you're caught, um, deliberately, maliciously harming these animals, um, then there are some local and state statutes that um, you might still get in trouble from. Hopefully nobody uh, on this call would be included in that group. Um, I assume most everybody is here because they actually like wildlife and want to protect it. But in the final analysis, things like this Eurasian collar dove that we see here are not protected by any laws. And if you wanted to take them into captivity and keep them as a pet bird, you would actually legally be allowed to do so. Now, whether or not that's ethically or morally appropriate to do is probably a discussion for another day. So how do you know is a baby that you're looking at orphaned or um, if you take that baby away from the wild, are you potentially abducting it? And, um, you know, again, we, we try to always sort of push this mantra of be kind and leave it behind because most people, um, you know, most lay people don't necessarily know the natural biology of that species. So I have a picture of a little fawn here and and that's because it seems like fawns and um, maybe baby bunnies and a few other species are really sort of the poster children for abduction and that's because um, the parents of uh, these um, little deer uh, are, are actually crepuscular and that means they're really only out cruising around at dawn and dusk and they only come back to feed that baby at those times so usually in the wee hours of the morning which is when people usually are not awake and so um, you know people will call and tell us well we watched all day long and the parents never came back so therefore this baby must be orphaned and sometimes that's true but sometimes it's just that you're not watching when the parents are going to be there so for nocturnal species like owls for example a lot of times they're perched way up in that tree somewhere and during the day they're just sleeping their babies are just hanging out and they're going to get active and haunt and come to feed those babies at night but not during the day and so a lot of people just because they don't understand the species or know what species it is um, behavior that is normal they're interpreting as abnormal and of course they're you know they're using humans as an example so a, a lot of these animals may seem very small, but um, they're actually ready to be out on their own. And so uh, again, it's always a good idea to call and sort of um, seek some input, again, from either state officials or local rehabbers. If you are in a position where you must take in a young animal because they, they clearly are orphaned and, and they need help, um, in general, I would say you shouldn't feed or water that animal. People who have done so um, risk feeding them the wrong things and making them ill or um, having uh, food or water go down the bird's windpipe um, rather than uh, down into their gullet. So um, then in that case, you're risking aspiration pneumonia. Um, so in general, you, you could take them in, place them in a warm, secure area. Uh, so just think about um, 
what are the temperatures outdoors uh, in the spring. So usually most of these guys are um, going to be comfortable in the 80s or 90s. And then um, just make sure that uh, nothing else can get to them. So no stray cats or um, dogs or anything like that. So place them somewhere warm, secure, and don't feed or water them. In some cases, um, you may be in a situation, for example, some of our um, veterinarians that are on the call or um, uh, uh, upcoming vet students, or uh, maybe you're in a situation, for example, um, some of our people on the call who are in St. Kitts, where um, help may not be readily available and you may be in a situation where you need to support that animal for longer than 24 hours. Um, in that case, it's a general rule of thumb that if birds um, are gaping like this, um, a lot of them are going to be insectivorous and um, you could go ahead and feed them moistened kitten chow. Uh, in general, birds that don't gape um, can either be syringe or gavage fed. And when we're looking at what do we feed these little insectivorous um, birds, so most of your songbirds are going to fall into this category, um, we use Purina 1 kitten chow and we actually soften that with water until it's nice and moist and then, uh, and then we're going to feed it warm, so like room temperature, you don't want to feed it cold, so if you've been keeping it in the refrigerator, you have to warm it back up, make sure you never microwave food before you feed it to a bird or you can cause burns. So in general, um, this softened kitten chow is going to be about 85% of the diet of most insectivores. Sometimes we'll add in a little scrambled egg as a protein supplement, so that could be up to 10% of our diet. The kitten chow is generally going to be about 85% of that diet. And then um, again, many of these guys are um, partially frugivorous, so that means they they like fruit. Uh, and again, um, it's important if you're going to release them back out into the wild one day that they recognize live insects as food. So it's not a bad idea to supplement them with some live insects. Um, remember, if you're feeding live insects, then those guys should usually be gut loaded. Also remember that when you first take these guys into captivity, um, they may seem very hungry. They're often, um, you know, gaping or crying. Uh, but it's important that those animals be warmed and rehydrated before they're fed. Otherwise, their gut really can't utilize that food. And then finally, um, a lot of times we need to supplement with calcium uh, for these birds to grow properly. And um, these are just one of the reasons why it's important that uh, you consult with or um, take these babies to an experienced rehabilitator because it really can be quite challenging uh, to get it right in terms of the diet. For example, some people um, have, uh, they say, well, if I'm feeding scrambled egg, I'm going to take those eggshells and just crush them up and feed them to the babies as a calcium source. But the problem with that is um, eggshells from raw eggs um, can often be contaminated with salmonella, so you could kill the baby that way. Or also raw egg um, has something associated with it um, called avidin uh, that is a part of the egg white. And um, that actually can interfere with those babies uh, absorbing some nutrients that are very, very important to them, like biotin, for example, so some of the B vitamins. And um, if they are certain kinds of birds, um, for example, earlier we saw uh, an adorable picture of a morning dove. And um, those little morning doves are um, granivorous, not insectivorous. And so uh, they are going to really need a diet that is more appropriate for them, so um, not quite so high in protein. And uh, the those guys usually do very well on some of the commercial hand feeding formulas that are available for um, baby pet birds. Uh, so an, a good example of one of these diets might be uh, Lefebvre's Nutristart. 
And um, this diet can be mixed according to directions and fed via syringe. Now, not all babies are going to be amenable to syringe feeding. And in that case, um, crop or gavage feeding may be necessary. And you can see in this diagram here, um, that really involves us inserting a tube uh, through the mouth, down the esophagus, and into the crop if it's a species that has a crop. And again, this is something that typically would only be done by um, a veterinarian or a wildlife health professional. Uh, again, remember that birds' normal body temperatures are somewhere in the neighborhood of 104 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Therefore, when we feed this food, we have to make sure that it's warm. Otherwise, we could cause hypothermia in our baby. So usually, we're going to feed these foods somewhere around 103 to 106 degrees and that helps keep the baby warm and also increases the palatability and acceptance of the diet. Um, with uh, most species of baby birds, we're going to feed somewhere between 5 to 10 percent of body weight per feeding. So it's important that we not overfeed these babies. And if you look in this area of the thoracic inlet, if these babies are full, a lot of times that crop will really be bulging. And in general, most babies that are hungry um, will open their mouths or beg for food or take the food willingly if they're hungry. Uh, if we're feeding, and again, some of these birds are very specialized. So for example, if you had um, a young uh, bird that um, was pisciverous or a fish-eating bird, uh, for example, this young osprey here, and you can tell this guy's young because his um, eyes are a little more orangish, whereas the adults are, are very gold in color. Uh, you would feed um, fish, either whole or sometimes in little pieces, just like the parents would. Or maybe you might have to puree it in a blender and feed it through a tube. Or sometimes a cat food-based um, fish diet uh, might be OK for temporary, like less than 24 hours of use. Or we may be able to use a critical care diet that's meant for, for piscivores, such as um, this Lefebvre MRA product uh, that we use quite a bit. And in fact, that's what we're using in the picture here with this young Osprey. Um, so some of these uh, critical care diets um, can provide uh, what this fish eating birds need. Um, again, if they're young, they're going to need special uh, diet for growth. So again, this would only be a temporary diet. Finally, some birds are very specialized and they are exclusively insectivorous. So, um, for example, these are young chimney swifts that we're seeing here. And um, a lot of people end up interfering with chimney swifts because these babies are in um, either their chimney or somewhere around their house that these babies um, cry pretty much all day. Uh, and um, the parents only come back for a second or two to shove insects down their throat and then they're gone again and then the babies um, cry quite a bit uh, particularly if they hear any noise so if you're making noise in the house or the parents are coming back that'll sort of set the babies off and this pretty much drives people yeah. crazy um, and so a lot of times they will abduct these babies and bring them into us but these guys are very hard to raise in captivity remember the chicks will leave that nest usually within a two to three week window and um, they are very hard to raise. Uh, and if they are raised on um, a soft artificial diet, like the hand feeding formula I showed you earlier, then they may refuse to ever eat insects and not even recognize insects as food. So that's great if you get them to weaning age, but then they may die if you release them into the environment. If I'm going to feed these guys, I do use um, almost exclusively mealworms. Uh, because these mealworms are very high and chitin um, as well as high in protein. Uh, a lot of times I like to soften them up a little before I feed them. So um, I know this sounds cruel, but, but basically I'll drown them in a liquid vitamin and water mixture to soften them up first for these little nestlings or their hatchlings. Um, and I like to use the Lefebvre uh, bird vitamins. Uh, and that way, um, and a little bit of 
calcium and that way uh, these insects are more nutritious before we feed them. A lot of people think that um, it is a good idea to offer um, uh, normal uh, bacteria uh, to kind of like inhabit the gut and have these babies do better. And so they think that uh, feeding something like yogurt would be a good way um, to give these animals what are known as um, probiotics, which is sort of natural bacteria that should live in the gut. Uh, that's great if you want to use um, commercial bird probiotics, but you shouldn't feed something like yogurt because birds lack the lactase enzyme that is necessary to digest milk and yogurt will definitely cause an upset tummy for these guys. Some birds, again, are extremely specialized. So um, some of these waders, like um, this uh, night heron that you see here, who looks like he's having a very bad hair day. Uh, and um, these guys are great to feed things like chopped smelt, um, sometimes greens, bloodworms, mealworms. Um, we'll usually put them on a base diet of waterfowl starter chow. Uh, if these guys are raised indoors instead of outdoors, it is very important that you meet their vitamin D requirements. Otherwise, they will develop angular limb deformities. Um, and if you are raising them inside, in addition to vitamin D, um, which I use, usually use the pediatric human formulation of vitamin D, um, which makes it very easy to give these little guys, uh, I will also provide artificial full spectrum light. Um, and that is, um, again, just a, a small example of how difficult it can be to raise baby birds properly. And we see baby birds all the time that people took them in, thought they were doing a good thing, did their best to raise them, were feeding them an inappropriate diet, and then about the time that the bird obviously has angular limb deformities or broken bones or um, the, the bird is dying, then they bring it to us and want us to fix it, and, and by then it can often be too late. Mm -hmm. Um, waterfowl, uh, it is very important that they get an appropriate diet. So we usually have to feed them a starter diet for the first two to three weeks. And that is a fairly high percentage of protein. And then for the next two or three weeks, we usually feed them a grower diet, which is kind of a mid-range of protein. And then finally, by the time they're about six weeks of age, these little ducklings or waterfowl or geese um, only need about 12 to 14 percent protein team. If they get more than that, then they can actually develop um, deformities at the carpus, uh, known as angel wing or airplane wing. And um, once they uh, start getting in their flight feathers, you cannot reverse that damage. And so those birds clearly would not be then releasable back into the wild because they cannot fly with um, that rotation at what essentially would be their wrist joint. Um, and so again, very important to leave this to the professionals. And um, also uh, these guys are, are flocking uh, species. And so it's really important that they not be raised alone. They can actually imprint heavily on people if they're raised alone. And uh, so it is important that you um, try to always find friends for them to be raised with. Uh, that will help prevent imprinting. And so I think the moral of the story here is that being raised by humans is really not the best option for um, uh, baby birds. So even if you think they have fallen from their nest, it is really important that we do everything we can to reunite those babies with their parents. Now, I know a lot of people, you know, read the statistics about things like, for example, in young raptors, they only have a 25 to 50 percent survival rate in their first year of life. So it, people may think, well, if I take this baby in and raise it, um, I can kind of give it a head start and that'll make it more likely that that baby bird will survive. However, there's a number of problems with this thinking. The first is that if that baby is eventually going to be a quote unquote productive member of society one day, um, they go through important periods of 
filial and sexual imprinting, which basically means they learn from their own parents how to be good parents, and they also learn from their parents how to be good mates. So if they don't get this early training by being raised by um, their natural parents or a foster parent, then they themselves may not one day be um, contributing to the species. And in that case, in some respects, they're um, kind of a drag on the system. So um, it's important that we reunite these abducted neonates with their parents. And here at Crow, we did a study in raptors where we showed that over a three-year period, um, at, so every nesting season for three years, uh, we had a 92.6% success rate with re-nesting raptors. So um, I know that these nests may look a little crazy, um, but actually uh, birds do very, very well with these uh, faux nests. So um, we do everything we can to get these babies back up into the nest. So here in this particular picture on the top, um, what we have is um, a group of power line workers Workers who are helping us re-nest some young osprey in this nest that's very, very high off the ground. And um, here we have a young owl in this middle picture that was found down on the ground. And um, this young great horned owl. And sometimes I think that great horned owl parents really need to take like a nesting 101 course because they are absolutely the worst nest builders in the world. Their nests always fall apart. And so we frequently find ourselves um, in the business of re-nesting these guys. Notice here how we've packed the nest with um, just some pine straw, which works very, very well. Notice also that the um, side here are open. That works really well because when these guys mute, which means when they when they um, go potty, basically, uh, they either need to be able to mute over the side of the nest, or in this case, we've made the um, sides a little higher so this baby doesn't wind up right back out on the ground, but he can mute through uh, the edges. It's also important because a milk crate like this allows any rain or anything to fall through the holes in the nest rather than potentially drowning the baby. So if you had something like um, a dish, uh, it might just fill with rainwater and potentially drown that youngster. So, um, and even if the nest doesn't really look like anything a bird would ever approach, so this bright purple um, double wide uh, accommodation that we have here, um, you know, that may look crazy to you, and certainly birds can see color. However, um, you don't have to worry about them not coming back to uh, take care of their babies because of this. In fact, um, these guys who had a, a beautiful view overlooking the lake, um, this was actually right next to a human hospital, and we really involved citizen science to have uh, these citizens tell us whether or not um, they feel that the babies need intervention or, you know, do they see the parents going back? Um, and, and that really works great. So we involve local citizens and they tell us whether or not they're ever seeing parents or whether they think the babies do need to come back in. And it was great at this human hospital because, you know, they're all health professionals. So they're all very concerned that the babies do well. And we were pretty much getting like a dozen calls a day letting us know that the babies were back doing very, very well. So um, this really can work. And how do you know whether or not it's appropriate for a baby to be out of the nest? Well, aging the babies is a good way to start. Usually, um, what we term as nestlings lack feathers altogether, so they're kind of bald, like that picture that we saw earlier that was kind of the face that only a mother could love kind of thing, or, or maybe um, crazy bird lovers like us, um, or they may be covered with down, uh, like these um, young doves here. Uh, usually, they're not able to perch, and um, if you find them on the ground, it's really, really important that these guys 
magpies be placed back into the nest. Left on the ground, they are in danger from predators and um, things like ants and um, all kinds of things. So it's good to put them back into the nest. If necessary, we definitely can construct an artificial nest. And here's a good example of what I said. Um, so you could take something like a Lefebvre's Nutriberries bucket, um, which makes a great artificial nest. We love these. <laughs> and um, empty all the food out. And um, we can actually nail this to the side of the tree. So place it as high up in the tree as you can reach. And remember to poke holes in the bottom so that if it starts raining, like it's pouring here now in Florida, um, so hopefully I don't lose you guys because we're having quite a storm right now. But if you have rain, um, that all the water would drain out. And uh, again, you can just um, pack it with some natural nesting materials. And that way, if the babies urinate or defecate and they can't get it over the side, it will just kind of um, sink down into the bedding there. Again, you can always call your local wildlife center for additional advice. Finally, um, and this is where we frequently have babies brought in, is the fledglings or the branchers. So these guys are truly trying their wings, so to speak. And um, initially, they may not be very good at it. And so, you know, they go to launch themselves from the nest in the hopes that they can fly and um, they, they wind up on the ground. That's okay. That's where they're supposed to be. Their parents will still go down and feed them and um, defend them and it will only take a couple of days before these guys are flying just fine. So uh, again, if you see um, their remiges, uh, which is their wing feathers or their flight feathers, which is what we're seeing on these beautiful blue jays here that are so bright, bright blue, or the retrices, which are their tail feathers, um, if those look like the shaft is purple or full of blood versus clear, like a, a feather that you would pick up off the beach, those are pin feathers. This guy is a fledgling or a brancher, and um, it's normal for him to be on the ground. So uh, again, um, we call them branchers because a lot of times as they leave the nest, they'll hop out along a branch and sometimes they, they lose their balance and um, fall. So in general, um, the best thing to do is to try to make sure that uh, you know any cats or dogs that may be in the area are hopefully kept indoors for the time being uh, and and soon enough these guys will fly away on their own so you can just leave them there if you do need to get that neonate back in the nest um, young again should either be reunited with their parents or if finding their parents appears to be an impossibility, um, we may be able to cross foster them into uh, a nest of the same species. And that works really, really well. It's very important that we try to get these babies to have some parental guidance. So um, in theory, you could bring these babies into captivity and feed and raise them successfully. However, when you go to release them out into the wild, um, they're, they're really going to have a hard time surviving in the wild at that point. And that's because hunting is instinctive for these babies. So the parents do not teach them how to hunt. However, what they do for these babies is the parents hang out and and they let their babies try to hunt. And if the juveniles are not hunting well and they're starving and crying for food, then the parents kind of provide some, um, you know, bridging support while these guys learn to hunt. And so that's why doing what we, what in, the wildlife business is known as a hard release where you keep them in captivity for X um, number of days and then when you think they're you know old enough to support themselves you just one day let them go um, that is known as a hard release 
More commonly, um, if we have to raise these babies in captivity, here at Crow, what we do is known as a soft release, which means we again continue to provide support for these babies while they learn to hunt. And eventually, they will stop coming back to the shelter that we provided for them uh, as they learn to hunt and survive on their own. So um, you can see it is, it is very complex. It is, it is not an easy thing to do. If you're going to re-nest a baby, um, one of the first things that um, we're going to need is to know where that baby came from. So we really need, ideally, very precise instructions on where you got that baby from. So here's where you guys can really help us out. Either, you know, really be able to describe where you got that baby or maybe get GPS coordinates if you're the finder. Um, maybe you can mark the area like the tree where that baby came from so sort of tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree uh, I guess I'm showing my age yeah. here um, but um, a lot of times if you bring this baby in if we examine it and it looks normal to us um, we are maybe going to send that baby right back out to where it came from or we may keep it for a day or so to test it to see if it's a brancher. Um, and in that case, uh, again, a lot of these guys, that's normal for them to be on the ground. And if you leave them out in the wild, their parents will still come and take care of them. Uh, if they're a cavity nester, um, like this beautiful little eastern screech owl that you see here, uh, then we may have to kind of um, reenact uh, the cavity that these guys would normally nest in. So um, this was an example where a tree was cut down and there were um, a baby eastern screech owls inside a cavity in that tree. So what we did was just take this faux nest and um, nailed it on the next tree over to where that tree was cut down uh, and um, those babies uh, were calling out for their mother uh, the very next night and you can see here she is flying in so we, we put a camera to make sure that she was coming back to feed her young and sure enough um, even though she had to take a, a you know a second look at this uh, faux nest that we made um, sure enough she just went right in to be with these babies because they're her babies and they're calling her and she knows that they need them so um, trust in nature it's going to work out just fine and um, again, if the parents don't come back right away, a lot of times what we'll do is use recorded baby, hungry baby calls um, to attract those parents back to the nest. And that way we can see almost immediately if the parents are going to come back. Here I've shown a nest from sort of the bottom side um, so that you can see um, the number of holes that we have uh, that will allow uh, stuff to drain through. And when we re-nest these guys, um, sometimes there isn't a great tree that's anywhere nearby. Really, you're looking for something that if those babies are artificially re-nested, and we may ask you guys to do this over the phone, so we don't necessarily always come out and do it. We try to describe to uh, Good Samaritans when they call us what we want them to do, because we simply don't have enough staff to go out on all these calls. So we want these guys in the shade. They don't need to be in the direct sunlight, especially here in South Florida. They'll pretty much roast if there's no shade. Um, we want some protections from the elements. So when it's pouring rain, like it is right now, um, it'd be good if they had some, you know, tree branches to shelter them. It needs to be somewhere that's easily monitored. So the good thing uh, about this nest is it's right here by the owner's house. So they probably can routinely look out of their window and tell you whether or not things are going well. Um, we talked about drainage, and a lot of times we will put um, cameras on these nests that have motion sensors so that when the parents fly back to care for the young, it actually activates the camera, and then we can retrieve the feed, and that will help um, answer the question of whether or not those parents are actually caring for uh, the young. 
Uh, parents, um, again, uh, if we have a baby that is in the original nest, so in this particular example, here is a young baby that is in the nest, and then way up here, I, I know it's hard to see, um, is the parent, and uh, we're going to re-nest um, this other baby who's been pushed out of the nest. We couldn't reach the original nest, so we just re-nested it a little lower lower in the tree, and in fact, the parents went back and cared for both. So sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, again, you just kind of have to watch and um, see if those parents are going to come back and care for both. And this was probably a case of siblicide, so probably this um, larger, older sibling uh, that was bigger pushed the younger one out of the nest. and. Um, and in that case, it's probably a good idea to not put it back in the nest because otherwise he's just going to push it out again. Uh, again, if adults are caring for clutch mates, they will accept usually a second baby um, back no matter how long that baby has been out of the nest. So sometimes we have babies that fall out and, and maybe they have an injury. So it's a few days before we can get them back in the nest. If the parents are still caring for the rest of the clutch, they don't ever seem to notice how many mouths it is they're feeding. So I, I often feel the same way. I have three small children. <laughs> I never notice if there's two, three, five, whatever, I'm just trying to, you know, feed them all and get them to be quiet. And um, sometimes it seems that birds are that way too. Um, but it is possible if the babies are older uh, that you may see um, uh, the bigger, more dominant birds pushing the little um, siblings out of the nest. Uh, we talked a little bit about branchers, and here's a good example of a great horned owl baby that is at the branching stage. So you can see he's out of the nest, he's on a nearby branch, um, he really doesn't have flight feathers yet, um, so he could potentially fall to the ground. If he does, that's okay. Again, his parents will care for him. If he doesn't fall to the ground, then what he's going to do is every, uh, every night go, you know, sort of back into the nest, and then his parents parents will feed him there. So uh, just some normal bird behavior, um, normal branching. Uh, if you cannot leave them on the ground, so here is a good example. This is a golf course and um, this guy's doing just fine. Every, everybody knew him on the golf course. Everybody watched out for him, so we were able to leave him there. But if they go to ground and they won't stay in the nest and the ground is too dangerous, for example, um, sometimes it's um, like right next to a hot major highway and you're worried that baby's going to get hit or there's feral dogs or cats in the area, then sometimes we'll bring these guys into what I call protective custody um, for a few days until they are actually able to fly. Uh, this works best if the parents still have babies in the nest. Otherwise, if you take this lone baby away and they don't have any babies to feed, they may decide that there's no more reason to stay in the area and they leave. So sometimes what I'll do is cross foster a younger baby into that nest to keep those parents in quote unquote um, nesting mode or parenting mode. And um, even if that baby is not related to them in any way, it doesn't matter. They will still take care of it. They don't really seem to know that it's not their baby and they will keep feeding that baby. And then what I'll do is um, when their own baby is old enough to go back out, I'll, I'll do another switch. And um, they, they never, it doesn't seem to bother them. Like I said, they're just like me at home, just feeding whatever mouths turn up at the dinner table that day. Um, I think if you have your own pet birds, which presumably many of you do, one thing that you need to be aware of is the danger that wild birds present um, not only to you, because there are certainly diseases that can go from wildlife uh, into people. I'm sure one or two of you can think of some prime examples that are going on right now of diseases that um, probably started out 
in wildlife and spread to people. Um, so those are what are known as zoonotic diseases. And anytime you touch a wild animal, it's really important that you either wear gloves and or that you wash up after you've handled those animals. So um, good examples of gloves you can wear. You can wear exam gloves like I'm wearing here in this picture handling this baby. Kitchen gloves work just fine. Gardening or leather gloves, all those would work. You want to try to protect yourself and um, certainly wash up after handling. If after handling wildlife, um, you're ill or maybe your pet bird is ill, uh, if you're ill, make sure you consult your own doctor. If some of your pet birds are ill after you've been handling wildlife, then you need to consult your veterinarian. Uh, there are lots of diseases that could potentially be passed to your pet bird. Um, so this particular baby you can see is literally crawling with these little red mites, which are blood sucking mites. And they basically, he's very, very pale. And the reason is because these mites are literally draining him dry of his blood supply. So you definitely don't want that in your pets. Um, bacterial diseases like Salmonella, for example, um, might be something uh, that could easily go from wild birds to uh, your pet birds. Um, viral diseases, this particular bird has pox virus and uh, that's definitely not something that um, you want to go to your little captive uh, finches. Um, parasites, again internal, external, these are all things that it's really important that you not um, bring wild birds um, permanently into your house, especially if you have pet birds. Finally, make sure that if you're going to catch up baby um, or young birds that you avoid injury both to the bird and also of course to yourself. So make sure again that you use appropriate equipment, like if they're young raptors, um, they can definitely talon you, so you want to make sure you have nice thick protective gloves. Uh, you may want to use things like nets. Um, for some of these birds who have sharp little stabby beaks, maybe you want um, eye protection, so things like eye or sunglasses would be a good way for you to protect yourself. And finally, I find with most baby birds, simply throwing a towel over them and scooping them up um, works very, very well to uh, keep them safe and you safe. Finally, again, we mentioned earlier, if you're going to um, catch up a, a raptor, a young raptor, like that great horned owl baby we saw earlier, or like this bald eagle here, who clearly isn't a youngster because um, they don't get this nice white quote unquote bald head until they're about five years of age, uh, you again are going to make sure that you are very careful in how you handle these guys, not only because they may talon you, but also because they may talon themselves. So note how we're holding these guys' feet. Wow. And so it's not always safe for you to do that. So I find a very good method to catch some of these um, young, uh, more dangerous birds up is what I call the box over method. So you just take a cardboard box with the flaps open and you gently lower it over the baby. And then you gradually fold each flap inwards so that the baby is kind of standing on the four flaps of the box. And then you very gently, gradually turn the box so that the flaps are up and you can secure those flaps. So that is the box over method and it works very, very well. Uh, and then um, here is again an example of using a towel to safely um, restrain these guys. So you're just going to gently drop the towel over them, uh, sort of press them down to the ground with your um, hands just very gently, and then move your hands down until you can grasp their feet. And then you can either um, hold them like that until you're able to get them to somebody who can help you or place them in some type of carrier like a cardboard box with holes poked into it so that they can breathe. And uh, a lot of times they'll have a, a grip on that towel and it's okay to just leave that towel in there. But again, make sure that they're um, not overheating and that they can get oxygen. 
So again, for advice, um, just remember that usually Mother Nature has got this under control. Uh, she usually doesn't need your help. If you're concerned and you're not sure whether or not a baby bird needs your help, feel free uh, to call your local wildlife rehabbers or um, wildlife officials, uh, and um, we will do our best to help you through it. Remember that a young animal should only be removed for the wild, from the wild after all efforts to reunite it with its parents have been exhausted because humans are never a young animal's best hope for survival. They are its last hope. And I wanted to thank Cliff Eber so much for having me lecture today um, and to you guys for helping us care for wildlife. And I don't know if I have time for questions or not. As usual, I'm so excited about my subject matter that I sort of talked on at length. Great. Well, Dr. Dr. Barron, um, I have a question and then I have an audience question for you just real quick, if, if you don't mind. Um, my question is in regards to the feral parrots, the naturalized parrots that some, a lot of the cities have, you know, like Amazons and Conyers and Quaker parrots. Um, is there any special considerations for them? Because, uh, you know, pet bird enthusiasts, you know, if they, if sometimes they come across a baby parrot that fell out of it, you know, of its nest and stuff in the wild. Um, considerations on what you should do in that instance? Well, um, it definitely depends on where you are and who you ask, probably. First of all, um, if that species is an invasive species in the area, um, wildlife officials uh, would certainly tell you, by all means, take that baby out of the wild. Feel free to keep it. Feel free to raise it as a pet. Um, because invasive species are very destructive and um, often compete for natural um, or native species in the area for resources. It certainly is, an, is not in any way illegal for you to keep that baby. Um, but I think, you know, whether or not it's ethical or, you know, whether some people would debate with you um, whether or not it's cruel to take that baby away from its parents and um, raise it yourself, especially if you're not experienced with hand feeding baby parrots. I can tell you, having done it for decades now, that it is a huge amount of work and, um, that there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but yeah, I think uh, that's one of those things that, yeah, like, what do you think? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Because um, um, I, I mean, we, we get, a, when I, at my bird talk days, we used to get a lot of questions from people um, about the wild parrots outside and, and such. So thank you for that. Um, so I, I do have a question. I'm going to stop sharing your screen there. Uh, I do have a question from Valerie. Um, she says, hello, I'm curious about the imprinting topic. Do you have any tips or techniques to minimize the chance of this occurring if you do end up with one baby bird or a group? Absolutely. So there's several things we can do. Um, the first is uh, if we have surrogate parents in captivity, um, we will use surrogates here at Crow. The second thing we can do is provide a mirror in the cage for the baby so that baby believes that he has conspecifics. Um, the other thing that we will do is we will call everywhere, far and wide, all other rehabbers, you know, in the state of Florida to see do they have one of those species so that maybe we could combine the two together? Um, and that is always a good uh, tip to do. The next is if all of those other things fail and you have to raise that baby to wear um, disguises as a human. So we have this really tacky camouflage baseball cap that um, we ha uh, have camouflage netting that hangs over our face so we don't look like humans anymore to the baby so they can't they don't see us as humans and we don't talk in the room with them because remember babies can imprint um, both by sight and also by sound so it's important that they not get used to human voices and then um, we will feed them with puppets 
so that they believe that they're being fed by um, their own species. And then we, we try to get them with um, one of their own species, hopefully as soon as we can. Remember, imprinting typically occurs in the first um, few, you know, very young phases of that bird's life. So if they're altricial, um, it's going to be about the time they open their eyes. Um, altricial means they're babies who can't survive on their own own and are very helpless and eyes closed and downy when they're young. If they're precocial, um, for example, ducks or goslings, which was sort of the topic of um, uh, Fly Away Home, I think was the name of that movie with the geese. Um, it happens as soon as they hatch the egg. So um, beyond that, um, imprinting is irreversible. So if you imprint a baby, that is basically a death sentence. It will not be able to go back out into the wild. Whereas habituation, which is just where um, birds have kind of become used to people, that is reversible. And so sometimes um, even if someone has inappropriately kept a bird for a long time and they seem very quote unquote tame to people, we still may have the possibility that we could reverse that and, and do what's known in the rehab business as wilding up for that bird. So we, we could make them um, be wary of people again and, and hopefully be able to be releasable. But with some species, particularly species that are a danger to people, and not just a danger to themselves if they think people are good. Um, a lot of times those babies can't be released. Wow. Okay, and we have a final question um, from Lisa. She says, thank you for sharing with us. A lot of people overseas tend to deworm companion birds. Do we know why uh, maybe part of importation and being around so many other birds? Sorry, I'm not sure I got that. So, um, about the deworming about companion deworming. birds. Um, so why, I, why would we, what would be um, a cause for deworming a companion bird? Um, is so we, I will say we don't routinely deworm companion birds necessarily. I usually do a fecal exam. Um, and if they're positive for parasites, then I choose an antiparasitic agent that would be appropriate for that particular parasite. If they're a wild bird and I've taken them in, um, I do the same thing. I definitely check them for parasites. And while they're in captivity, if I feel like I need to deworm them, I will. But just remember, parasites are kind of a, a normal thing. So those are internal intestinal parasites. Um, if it's external parasites we're talking about, um, which I assume it's internal because she said deworm, mm -hmm. um, again, it, it would depend on what I was identifying as to how I would deal with that particular parasite. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Barron. Really appreciate your insight today. Um, hopefully that'll um, give people a lot of answers, uh, especially as we enter, you know, this, this springtime with all the nests and such and all the wild birds and baby birds out there. So thank you very, very, very much. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. And, um, so for our audience, I'd like to uh, invite you for our next webinar next Friday, uh, June 12th um, at 1230 p.m. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Lamb will be covering indoors or outdoors, what is right for your parrot. So join us then. Um, keep a lookout for our, our newsletter email about the webinar and make sure you sign up. Uh, in the meantime, stay healthy and stay safe and all the best to you and your flock. Thank you. Bye. Bye.